Hello and welcome to module 1.3 of the GPS MOOC. Before you get started learning the serious technical details of GPS, we're just going to take this video to tell you about the joy of GPS. And what do I mean by that? Well, here's the outline of our video today. And, and this video today is not the outline of the course. We just did that a couple of videos ago. But this is to give you a feel for what the science of GPS is like. Just a little taste of what it's like. And the way I'm going to do that is, first of all, show you how simple it is, that you, you can just use one slide to explain the basics of how GPS works. Yet it's deceptive. There's no end to the details of it. So it's, it's simple, but very deep. And as you dig into the details of GPS, you find that it's very beautiful. And so uh, I'll explain those two things. And in the, along the way, you'll see how GPS brings together technology, science, and culture, and that there's a technology transition going on right now that will benefit you. And then finally, we'll get into some of what makes it deep and beautiful. So here is the promised single slide explanation of how GPS works. GPS signal starts at the satellite and travels to the Earth in about 70 milliseconds. And your GPS receiver will observe this phase change. You'll notice the signal has a phase change in it. Your GPS receiver will observe that. And by knowing the delay between when the signal was sent and when it was received, this value tau, which we'll talk about throughout the course, by knowing that delay, multiplying by the speed of light, we know how far we are from the satellite. By knowing how far we are from several known points, we can work out where we are. And that's it. That's how GPS works. Very simple. Uh, so before going into some of the deeper details, I want to give you a little snapshot of some uses of GPS that maybe you're not so familiar with. Uh, you're probably all familiar with navigating in your cars or using uh, GPS uh, to geotag your photographs or something like that. But GPS is used in a whole range of sciences, including geoscience. And an example of this is something called the continuing, continually operating reference stations. And what these are are these things known as monuments, which are uh, tall concrete pillars that are concreted deep into the ground and stand up about as high as a person. And on top of that is a GPS antenna, as you can see in this picture right, right here. Uh, and these are placed all over the world, and they do differential GPS and can measure their location to an accuracy of millimeters. And as a result of that, they can measure crustal deformation. So you can go and see how the Earth's crust is moving thanks to GPS. And a byproduct of this is that when the crust moves a lot, we get to see it thanks to GPS. And a recent example of this came about from the earthquake that happened near the Fukushima power plant in Japan. The epicenter of the earthquake was a place called Tohoku, Japan. And that was a, a large earthquake, as I'm sure you remember. The nuclear power plant uh, got severely damaged and is still in a, in a bad state. But from the scientific point of view, those reference stations that I just talked about measured that the motion on, at their locations all over the Earth for the five hours, five hours subsequent to that earthquake. And in a paper by Greg Barroza of Stanford Geophysics Department, this plot was presented. And what this plot is, is the amount of displacement from normal for each of the different reference stations. And on the vertical axis, we, what's shown here is the arc distance from Tohoku, Japan, in degrees. So for example, if you were the antipodal point somewhere uh, over South America, or near South America, you'd be 180 degrees away. So the furthest you can get is 180, and then you'd start moving back. And we are in Stanford, California. If you measure the arc distance there, it's 73 degrees. And so our line is one of these here. And so what this shows, if we follow that line, is that after about an hour from the earthquake, we moved by about this much. And that is about two centimeters. And you can see this wave propagating around the Earth and then back and then back again for five hours. So the remarkable thing about this is that 
thanks to the GPS measurements, we know that every one of us, unless we were in an airplane at the time, was moved by this earthquake by several centimeters, uh, which is just gives you quite a profound feeling for the magnitude of this thing. So that's just an example of some of the science. And then culturally, uh, you'll know that GPS has become embedded in our culture. Uh, Facebook is always encouraging you to check in and find where your friends are. Uh, you might use it for navigation all the time. People use it for running and cycling and hiking, uh, for geotagging your pictures. And just uh, by a couple of hours ago, my phone buzzed me and said exactly this. This was the screen of my phone a couple of hours ago. Time to leave for your MOOC recording session to, in order to arrive on time based on current traffic. And it worked. Here I am. So let's take a look at the technology evolution of GPS. Uh, GPS began, the system began th over 30 years ago. And in 1978, we had the first portable GPS receiver, which wasn't very portable. You see it there, um, a 25 pounds backpack. That's 11 kilograms. That was just a GPS receiver. And then 1989, about a decade later, you had the first commercial handheld receiver that cost $1,000. There it is. It's, uh, it was made by Magellan. Uh, and then through the 90s, we saw the proliferation of in-car nav systems. Maybe you owned one. And then in the late 2000s, we started to get GPS in smartphones. Uh, this was, in fact, the very first smartphone with GPS. It's the HP iPad shown on the screen there. And the GPS went inside it in a small board that, you, that is shown on the screen. So that was in 2005. And now in 2014, every smartphone has GPS in it. And one of the reasons is that the, the entire GPS circuitry is on a single chip in all those smartphones that's two millimeters big. And so that's shown on the screen, a little black dot in that last white picture. And I've actually got one of those chips here. And you, you can't even see it, which is sort of the point. It's two millimeters by two millimeters. And that's what the GPS is like inside your smartphone. So what we're seeing is that a technology transition is happening right now. Navigation is a field that for millennia was the province of the elite. It was done by officers in navies and armies. And it was done literally by priests in times gone by. And now everybody is a navigator. You've got your smartphone or tablet, and you can find your way around. And so navigation, the field of navigation, thanks to GPS, is moving towards the masses. So that's cool. But it's quite profound when you think about it, because this kind of thing happens very rarely. And there's two uh, famous examples. Literacy was something very similar. It was the province of the priesthood, basically. Scribes knew how to read and write, and the masses did not. And the printing press changed that and allowed the masses to become literate. And that happened around 1500 and completely changed the world. And computing went like that. Uh, you, computers used to exist as mainframes. And in a way, it had its own priesthood. There were people in universities who looked after those computers and would not let anyone else near them. And then in the 80s, the personal computer brought computing to the masses. And so a similar transition is going on with navigation thanks to GPS. And the significance of this is that if you're in the middle of one of these transitions, you have an opportunity for tremendous things to happen. You can get rich. You can do great science. And you are in the middle of this transition right now. So now let's move back to the, the science and, and look at how, while it's very simple, it can get very deep very quickly. And so let's just go back to the beginning and say, how does GPS work? Satellites transmit their positions. You measure ranges. Several ranges give you your positions. That's very simple. And then through this course, we'll learn about something called assisted GPS. And that can be summarized equally simply that instead of the satellites giving you their positions, a network such as a cellular network can give you the satellite positions. And the picture for that looks like this, that you have the satellite sending a measurement that you just take a range from. And instead of getting the data from the satellite, you get the data from some cell tower shown here. And the data would come to you from the cell tower, which happens quicker and easier than getting it from the satellite. And so 
Cell tower tells you the satellite's position. You still measure your range from the satellite and get your location as before. Simple as that. But this, now let's ask one of the first questions that will take us deeper. How do we know the satellite positions? How does the cell tower know? How does the satellite itself know what position it's at? Well, to answer that question, we have to go back in history to the people who worked out the science of orbits. And it all began with a gentleman named Tuco Brahe, who was Danish. And you see his picture here on a Danish stamp. And he made very precise observations of the planets and documented them. And that information was used by Johannes Kepler, shown here on a German stamp. And the observations from Tuco Brahe were so accurate that this allowed Kepler to work out his famous three laws, which are, Kepler's first law, we'll write K1, is that all planets orbit the sun in ellipses with the sun at one of the foci of the ellipse. Kepler's second law is that planets will sweep out areas that are equal in equal amounts of time. So that's what's shown on this drawing here, that in some time t, this area a, in the same amount of time, you'll get the same area here. And if the planet goes further from the sun in that elliptical orbit, in that amount of time, it'll be area a there. And that's the significance of that which you should be able to see here, is that the planet goes faster when it's closer to the thing it's orbiting around, in this case, the sun, and slower when it's further. So Kepler's second law is equal areas in equal time. And Kepler's th third law relates the period of the entire orbit to the semi-major axis of the orbit, and it tells us that the period squared is proportional to the semi-major axis cubed. And I've taken the trouble to write these down because uh, the famous physicist Richard Feynman said that not only should engineers know all of Kepler's three laws, but anyone graduating from college should know these three laws in order to consider themselves educated. And seeing as we're in the business of satellites, we should certainly know them. So I've placed them there. But the significance in our story about knowing orbits is that once Kepler had used Brahe's observations to come up with his three laws, it allowed Isaac Newton to postulate his law of gravity shown here. So here's Isaac Newton's law of gravity that says any two bodies attract each other with a force, F, that's proportional to the mass of the one body times the mass of the other body and inversely proportional to the distance between their centers squared. So how did Newton come up with this? Well, he came up with it by studying Kepler. And he showed that if you have this law, then you could replicate Kepler's laws. You could, you could recover Kepler's laws. And that's what this drawing is. This drawing here is, was drawn by Isaac Newton. It's in his book, Principia Mathematica, listed down here. And you can actually go and download that book from the internet and see for yourself this drawing drawn by Isaac Newton. And what he's doing here is showing Kepler's second law. That he's showing that you can get the ellipse and you get equal areas in equal time. And thanks to this, we know that the force that moves the planets around, and nowadays the GPS satellites, is the very same force that makes the apples fall. And there's Newton commemorated by the apple on the stamp. And so why do we care? Well, this is how we know where satellites are. We begin at this point with a reference network. So each of the satellite operators, such as, for example, the US Air Force, who put the first system up, they put up the satellites, and then they observe measurements from a reference network of observing stations and see where the satellites are and then apply Newton's law to propagate where they will be in the future. So they calculate, using Newton, they calculate precise positions analogous to Tuco Brahe observing the positions. 
the operator of any system calculates the future positions, and then they have precise data. And using that precise data, they pack it into Keplerian format, which you will learn about in this course. And that information is transmitted from the satellite or from the cell tower. And that's how we know where the satellite positions are. So there's this very beautiful link of the most famous space scientist of antiquity through to today. And so you might be saying, oh, well, that's nice, but I don't really care about history. What about modern science? Well, there are clock calculations that must be taken into account too. And this is what brings us to modern physics. And specifically, we have to take into account Einstein's theory of general relativity and special relativity. Now, the reason for this is that the G GPS system works because there are very precise clocks in each of the satellites, and they are synchronized with each other to nanoseconds. And they need to be because light travels one foot in one nanosecond, so 30 by 30 centimeters in one nanosecond. So to get the kind of accuracy that we want in GPS, we need very precise clocks. However, we know that according to Einstein's theory of general relativity, when gravity gets less, time literally goes faster. Time is more free where gravity is less, literally. Time literally goes faster where there's less gravity. And where the satellites are, there is enough less gravity that time goes faster by 45 microseconds each day. So if this was somehow not accounted for, it would make a very big difference to the system because light travels 300 meters in one microsecond. So light would travel 300 meters times 45 microseconds. And you'd be making, you'd be finding the satellite to be kilometers further away or closer than you expected if, you, if this was all wrong. Also, there's Einstein had his theory of special relativity that says as objects move faster, time slows down, and the satellites move about three kilometers per second relative to us and or relative to the Earth. And so time slows down by seven microseconds per day because of special relativity. So the combination of those two means that at the satellites, time goes faster by 38 microseconds each day. And so each GPS satellite literally is programmed so that its clock runs slower on Earth by 38 microseconds each day, so that when it gets up into orbit, because of general and special relativity, it'll run faster by 38 microseconds and therefore run at the expected speed. So that in itself is quite profound and amazing. But there's more. There are eccentric variations in the orbit. In particular, the orbit won't be perfectly circular. And at some stage, the satellite will be slightly further away and going slightly slower, or slightly closer and going slightly faster. And because of the change in gravity and the change in speed from those small variations, these adjustments that, that have to be made have to themselves be adjusted. And that is something that happens in real time, can't be programmed in advance. And we use the orbits that, that are given to us to know what the adjustment has to be. And here is some code. This is the kind of code that is in your cell phone. Every time you use your GPS, this code is exercised. And if we look at what's inside here, we'll see there's this term EK, which is something known as the eccentric anomaly. And you'll learn about that later. But what you can see right now, it's solved for by something called Kepler's equation. And so it tells us how eccentric the orbit is. And so that term goes into an equation along with this relativistic term to work out how much to adjust the clock correction. So there's a clock correction. And so what you see here is Kepler. And uh, so you've got Kepler up here, and you've got Einstein down here. And maybe in no other discipline that you will do in your life will you see Kepler and Einstein combined on the same page. And this is not even just on the same page. Here we have them combined in the same line of code. How cool is that?